Good afternoon, everybody. My name is William Smuabu. Um, I want to first thank uh, Anna and uh, his colleagues for bringing me here from Dhaka, Senegal. Um, I'm very grateful to you and to your colleagues for also creating an opportunity for me to see, to meet some of my friends, people that have related with online and uh, including Allah Mame, with whom I have done papers without meeting you know, face to face. Um, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity in Cordestria to come and share what we do. I am a Nigerian. Um, I'm affiliated to the Africa Regional Center for Information Science, University of Ibadan, Nigeria. Um, from there, I went for a loan to University of South Africa, where I'm currently affiliated. And then, um, from there, I was further borrowed by Cordesia to come and set up the Open Access Project, which is what I'm doing right now. So, what I want to do in this presentation is to just present to us what Cordesia has started to do in respect of Open Access. From first principles, yeah, just first principles, what Cordestria, because Cordestria is looking at open access um, from the beginning. Yeah, uh, Cordestria means Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa. It was established in 1973 by a group of Pan Africanists who had the burden to address African issues to develop African thinking, African-focused knowledge, to address issues um, about knowledge production imbalance and um, imbalance in, in, in international in, in, um, in flow of knowledge between Africa and other parts of the world. Um, Kodesha also adopts innovative strategies to market the knowledge produced in Africa. That's one of the aims of Kodesha and um, to also create a stimulated, vibrant, and connected African social science community. If you look at these objectives, you would see that these people were re responding to a situation that occurred in Africa uh, between the 1960s and early 1973, when early 1970s, the era we know as the national science era, and that was the era when independence was beginning to, you know, uh, African states were beginning to be independent. Um, colonial masters <coughs> were leaving and handing over to, you know, uh, uh, African, uh, African states. And um, there was an observation that Africa had become so defragmented in all aspects. But these scholars were particularly interested on issues of knowledge. Africa was defragmented in terms of, in respect of knowledge between Senegal and Gambia. These are Wolofs. Mali, these are Wolofs. But once you enter Mali, you speak French. You enter Senegal, you speak, you, enter, you cross Gambia, you speak English. You enter Senegal, you speak French. And I mean, it was, you, you pass and enter Guinea-Bissau, you speak Portuguese. And these are countries that actually could speak one language, all of the same in East Africa, countries that could speak one language, um, Swahili, but can become so defragmented, and these affected knowledge production, affected science and technology. Individual countries were defining their problems and the, and, and the solutions to their problems on the basis of the heritage they received from the colonial masters. And so that was why uh, Condesa was set up to try to address African problems from African pers perspective, not African pers problem from the perspective of the heritage of the colonialists. And so um, the, there was a focus on economic growth. Uh, Africa was defragmented. There was growth of inequality, knowledge exchanges between Africa and the developed world. There was also Early and uh, sometime in the middle of 70s, the Syria crisis, which was global but affected Africa the most. Um, and um, 
this organization was set up to address these issues. Cordestria is um, relatively very popular because of um, the way it has been organized and the issues it addresses. And um, adopt this strategy since 1973. Conferences, research grants, thematic, national, multinational, cooperative research networks, workshops, seminars, symposia, support for thesis and dissertation development, exchange programs, and recently we added the diaspora program, where we are trying to create um, an environment where Africans in diaspora can you know, collaborate with Africans at home in order to improve um, research capacity of scholars and, and students. Um, Codestra is a membership organization, um, individual members and institutional members. Um, but um, these members are not sources of funding to the organization. We are um, honorable beggars. We depend on funders for funds. And uh, we are always grateful to SIDA, which has funded Codestria for 43 years now. Yeah, since 1973, SIDA has constantly, consistently you know, giving funds to, to Cordestria enough for us to do all that we do. And Cordestria um, has addressed knowledge production in Africa through textbooks which it produced and distributed free of charge to universities and research institutes because there was need for us to rewrite African history. There is evidence that African history is distorted. Okay? African history, research methodologies, who Africans are, what they are. It was Patrice Lumumba who many years ago said, charge African scholars, say, rewrite African history. And Cordesia set out to do that. But um, uh, we, today we have 12 journals, 14 actually as I was coming, including a journal we call Methods. Methods was established a few years ago to challenge the, to question the, the, the relevance of methodologies you know, um, to African the, the standard methodologies or international methodology, whatever international means. Because you know sometimes when you hear international, you're talking about what's happening in America and Europe. When it happens in Africa, it's local, I mean. So <laughs> it's, it's very, it's very, if it is international, then there, there has to be a collaborative, there has to be a consensus. If it says international standard, what, what does that mean? You need a standard in Europe, a standard in Africa is local. I mean, those are issues Cordestrian and African scholars and Africanists, like myself, we have contended with. And we are comfortable to stay in Africa to address young people, teach young people, um, build skills in young people. Um, we also do policy dialogues at different, at different levels where we talk to African uh, policymakers and leaders. Of course, that's very important because, you know, Africa has um, for a long time been ruled by people who don't, who who uh, African leadership has not been very productive and has not been very effective. And that is why Cordestria does not collect money, does not go to African countries for money. We depend on funders. Yeah, and if you look at this, you see that prior to the present day open access, Cordestria has embraced what I call a pseudo form of open access because our information has always been made available to people free of charge. Now, the big issue, the access to knowledge, um, this is a very complex subject matter, but um, I always ask, which knowledge, what knowledge, by who, and to where, okay? And then I can take you back to the theme of this conference, which is talking about democratizing access to knowledge. And um, if you look at the first question, which knowledge, Local knowledge is necessary for appropriate development. African scholars, I mean, or local Southeast, are distinguished scholars have argued that any information that would be useful in addressing African development must be developed in Africa. And the reasons are very simple, as, as we go ahead, we may see. For example, I can give you an example of what is happening in Africa now. Two years ago, we had predictions that Nigeria, Kenya, and Ghana, and some other African countries were going to overtake European countries in terms of GDP and things like that. Less than a year after that, these economies have crashed. Today, Nigeria is in recession, Ghana is in recession, Kenya is in recession. And of course, one wants to answer, ask questions. Where did the data, upon which basis these predictions were made, produced? Okay, where were they produced? Who produced the data? 
and you have a simple answer this data were not produced in africa they were not produced with the assistance and cooperation and collaboration of africans they were data produced elsewhere and statistical analysis carried out on them and predictions were made and international policies were are being made on the basis of data that has no relevance at all to the environment under this course. And of course, there are several, several issues you can raise about that. Data generation analysis, interpretation, and application must be executed at home using home sensitive instruments on, on, and methodologies. How do we explain the GDP revisions of Ghana, Kenya, and Nigeria? You know, uh, the macroeconomic indicators, which, I mean, these countries are in trouble right now. Due to a number of situations, African Development Forum said this recently, uh, um, unfavorable to the production of knowledge in developing countries, its practices still disembody, conducted from outside and disconnected from use in public policy. This is an obvious fact. I give you an example. You see, Africa, Nigeria has 140 something universities. Okay? 140 something universities. If you're coming from outside to do research methodology, consider your cost, consider the cost of your, of your hotel accommodation, consider communication, consider cultural issues, and you come and talk to 20 students and you, you have made a lot of progress. Out of how many students? As a statistician, that's where I started my work. Each time I see a simple statistic, I ask myself, out of what is the numerator? Okay? And you see that much of this data, this research, research coming from outside, don't really practically address African issues realistically because Africans are not participants. Africans are not do not contribute in issues. When they contribute, they contribute on the fringe. Appropriate development is purely ecological, connected to local realities. Ecology is interaction between man and his environment, okay, and uh, or organism and his environment, connected to local realities and geared towards public policy making. There are several studies. You know, for instance, I cited Devarajan, who, who you know, wrote an article in 2011, which he called Africa Statistical Tragedy. And he was asking, where is the source of the data you are using to project African development? Kathleen did another study later, which he called Poverty in a Rising Africa. And he was also questioning the source of data for a country where a continent where people are poor, and you have all kinds of projections that are, you know, painting the economy, economies as a growing economy, and quite a number of studies like that. Um, we must also look at knowledge um, from the perspective of utility versus visibility. For me, as uh, I have been teaching for many years and have written quite a number of papers, maybe more than a hundred, with over forty published in UK here. I have come to a point where I have started to ask myself the question, what is the essence of research? Am I doing research to be seen? Or am I doing research to supply information, supply, create influence, enlighten people, educate people? Okay? The international thinking, quote unquote, is that I should do research to become visible. Am I invisible? I'm not invisible. I should not struggle or negotiate for visibility. I should do research in order to influence people and share that research where it will be useful. In 1977, Eugene Gaffey did a study where he showed that much of the research published by Africans in American journals were never read by anybody. Why then would you insist that somebody should publish in America when you know that the papers are not going to be read? And the reasons he gave, they were simple. The scopes of the study were very narrow. The subjects were not interesting. I mean, interesting to who? Interesting to the local environment, but uninteresting to the outside environment. <coughs> the primary essence of this knowledge must be to inform, enlighten, and educate. Not production of research papers, not competition in the number of papers produced, not targeted promotion and tenure. Publication abroad or publish, perish at home. We are all used to publish or perish. But that's a different thing that happens in Africa. It is either you publish abroad or you perish at home. Now I have changed it. It is publish abroad and perish at home. Because people are only publishing abroad to be seen, to be promoted, and not to address any problem. Circulated where they are needed and not circulated abroad or in what is called international journals, languages that are difficult to really understand. And this is why Cordesria initiated Open Access Project, because one of the major uh, pillars of Cordesria is to disseminate African-focused, African-centered model. It is an African-friendly publishing policy, and, um, and it gives us a, an opportunity to domesticate okay, African science, African knowledge, in the absence of new enclosures, which I'm going to show you. 
The South Caucasus Publishing Scientific Journals will at least, this at least we have statistics that public publications, number of papers in Africa has increased in the past few years as a result of uh, open access. But when you analyze the diagnosis, you ask yourself, how does this address the question of imbalance? It doesn't address the question of imbalance because we are just looking at how Africans have used open access journals. We're not looking at how Africans are really participating in research. How many of these open access journals are African in origin? And when you look at you know, some indicators like the open access, you wrote the Roama and the repositories, <coughs> you see that, <coughs> excuse me, you see that it is not really realistic to measure African participation in open access that way. So Cordesia decided to take a look at open access in Africa, and we discovered that <coughs> the, the African situation uh, needs to be more understood. It is not as easy as it is being mentioned, people are using open access journals. And if you look at Africa, then thank you very much. You see, this terrain is completely uneven. At individual level, and in some institutions or some countries, you find evidence of open access. But if you look at the continent, you see that open access is on the ground level. And we identified four issues which we have to address. Science policies in region, I can address each of these if I'm given the opportunity. APCs, these are new emerging enclosure, it's a new enclosure. And technology itself, technology itself is a new enclosure. And of course, the human resources and its flow. And um, science policies, they are weak, national institutional science policies, access of research councils, publishing and broad trashes local journals. That is what is happening. And the uh, absence of open access policies. Um, Agricultural processing charges only for countries in Africa pay APC. But yet, scholars in Africa pay APC. Where do they get the money? They borrow, they sell land, they borrow money from cooperatives, borrow money from banks, and Cornelia says, no, Africa cannot afford APC. Research funding is not available at home. Research funding is very slim from abroad. Okay, and these are stocking open as article processing charge is also stocking open, uh, uh, fake publishing. That makes the image of science in Africa. In a recent paper, I I actually said that open uh, the article processing charges, which is stocking fake publishing, is actually supporting racism because open uh, fake publishing is not only open access. Fake publishing is there in print journals. In fact, it's more in print journals. Open access journal is about four to six percent. Why the noise about predatory journals and open fake open uh, fake publishing in open access journals and not at all in the you know print journals where Africans you know do not do not have a, a lot of input. Then the role changing role of technology the OA is a technology sprout that can build on these issues extensively. There is a rapidity in the changes of the technology. New technology more business models are appearing every day, and at the end of the day, the aggregate cost is so high, so so high for Africans to bear. Okay, these are the issues after we are looking at. We're looking at human resources. One of the major challenges we have in the organization where I work now is brain drain. I joined Cordestria on loan three um, about 12 months ago. I met three IT staff. As of today, all of them have uh, two of them have left and left with only one. And this one is also busy applying for visa lot reserve there. In the next few months, it's going to go. I will remain alone. I will start afresh. And these are challenges. You have the remuneration patterns, which are low, which do not favor people working in research institutions or in universities, and they're looking for bigger money. We also have the issue of skills. Since they cannot stay, where will they get the skills to address issues we are looking for? So we decided to address open access from the beginning, assuming that nothing has happened. By you know, putting together a conference on 29th of April to the 1st of May. A huge conference bringing policymakers, university vice chancellors, and people from different you know, uh, aspects of the African economy. And we had this conference and we came up with a declaration that has gone very far. Dakar Declaration on Open Access, which was jointly funded by Cordesia, UNESCO, and Claxo. And well, what we are saying is we are standing on the issues that Africa cannot pay over NPC. Africa, you know, needs uh, to contribute in digital publishing, not just using already established open access journals. We also came up with strategies for marketing and implementing the declaration, working groups to establish working groups, steering committees on open publishing in Africa. We have cross 
stakeholder linkages, interactions, liaisons, collaboration opportunities, each of these is complex and we've done quite a lot of work on that. Then this, uh, we are, what we are doing now is building consensus because uh, we, we, some of the, the, the declaration actually had some impact. Some countries that, were, that had already adopted APC had, have invited us to say, okay, now if you don't want us to pay APC, what do you want us to do? And we're working on issues like that. We've looked at what is happening in four of the countries that have adopted APC. It's paying huge money, huge amount of money. Poor countries where people earn low income, low salaries that cannot compare with their colleagues anywhere. You, you pay a huge amount of APC to developed countries who, you know, you know uh, which CODESA feels is very unacceptable. We have the CODESA African Regional Repository. This is uh, being done in collaboration with uh, um, IFM. CODESA Open Educational Platform, CODESA African Open Access Journals. Here, what we want to do is to do hosting of, of um, we want to produce a hosting service to open access journals in Africa. For example, you have quite a number of startup journals, new journals, and fake journals also. Those ones you need to weed them out um, by products, pro providing a sort of standard uh, upon which basis you can assess what those journals are doing. But new challenges are beginning to emerge, funders are beginning to withdraw their money. Funders are beginning to withdraw their money uh, because of uh, the, the human flow, the new refugee, uh, the, the human flow, which are you know, forming new, uh, bringing about new uh, human communities. Of course, that is the reason they gave us. And um, um, human resources at all levels continue to pose serious challenges. I'm sure that is why we have some, you know, uh, you train them at home, that's interesting thing. You train them at home, by the time they acquire some skills and they, they go. And uh, what we need most now is collaboration. That is the only way for us to go. For example, I'm in Cordestria, standing on three different projects. I'm in charge of the Open Access Project, which is complex for 56 countries. I'm in charge of the African Citation Index, which is already delivered. I'm also working on the African Archiver Project. Of course, you know, you cannot do any good job if you're doing things like this. The only two way we can go ahead in view of you know, funding constraints is collaboration. Okay? Relying on relationship, an interrelationship with you know, uh, good-minded organizations, you know, organizations that have good intentions to do one thing or the other. Another thing we do is to... We need a lot of training. Um, um, training, um, just like I have discussed with quite a number of people here. You have skills, you develop them at the first degree, and maybe master's degree. By the time they settle down to do hands-on, they are gone. Okay? But we need to start readdressing issues, and we need technical assistance. And Cordesia is here. Uh, I'm so glad that um, several people here know about Cordesia. They saw my tag, and people were saying, oh, I know about Cordesia, we know about Cordesia. Cordesia is such an influential organization, not only in Africa, but in the whole world. We are partners to many organizations, international agencies, United Nations agencies, and regional organizations, and things like that. But now, uh, with the withdrawal of our funders, and some of us who withdraw from, from Cordesia for that, we are looking for new alignments, new strategies, new patterns, you know, that will enable us to address African issues. I want to end by, by cracking a joke. Um, yeah, in the in the 60s, when I was born, I was uh, taught a song, you know, which you must recite on the exam day. You dare not fail it. Pussycat, pussycat, where are you going? I'm going to London to see the Queen. You must get it right. If you got it wrong, you are trashed. You'll be put under the sun because you couldn't recite that you're going to London to see the Queen. And it took me over 40 years to visit London after. And I didn't see the pain. It's an illustration of the kind of intellectual frustration, obfuscation, and suffocation, okay? Scholarship goes in, goes, you know, scholars go through in Africa, trying to sprout from an environment where you are looking for an euphoria, which you may not arrive at. All we have to do is to depend on collaboration, depend on interrelationship with people, good-hearted people like Norad, like Sida, who have done so much for Africa so that we can continue producing. Thank you so much.